always amazes me how God brings just special people to this program, his program, Healing Miracles. Welcome to Healing Miracles. And today's very special guest, Betty, who has an incredible testimony. And she's going to share with us how the Lord transformed her from a Vegas showgirl and all its lifestyle into a preaching, teaching on fire pastor. So we're going to just introduce her now because she has, as I said, an incredible testimony. Welcome, Betty. It's so good to be with you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I know you're a very busy lady, and yes. you have told your testimony to thousands of people. You've been on television many times yes. on all kinds of programs and all well-known programs, 700 Club, um, Benny Hinn, Trinity, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of different yes. people have had you on their programs. And each time, many people have been saved, haven't they? I would say I get letters of probably uh, thousands of letters and phone calls, and it never stops. And uh, 700 Club repeated it like they still repeat it. They did it seven times straight, and then they kept repeating it every once in a while. I throw it back on because it's you know, very shocking, and uh, people, I will get calls and, and letters, and, and they're, they're, they're desperate. They're desperate to be healed. They're desperate, and they're looking for something real. Yes. And I have something real. Yes, you do. That's a good part and, about and, it. And what's, well, about your testimony is that it has so many phases to it, and mm -hmm. it's so, so many things happen to you. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a soap opera. And, and you know the good part about it, if there's someone out there today that thinks that God don't love them or, or they're no use or they don't have a ministry or something, wait till they hear how God took a Vegas girl and turned her in to have a mantle laid on you by Paul Young and Cho's mother-in-law. Only God, only the grace of God Amen. can do what he's done it to someone like me. That That's what's so awesome about your testimony, Betty, is... There's people out there that think they are so sinful and so terrible, and they've, they've done so many horrible things in their life, and, and, and they've just come against God in so many different ways that they feel that maybe they can't be forgiven. And unworthy. And unworthy. That they're how not could good anybody, enough. How could anybody clean up their act? How could anybody actually help them? to clean up their act because it's it's so terrible and and so many people I I think have the impression that they're the only ones mm -hmm. nobody is as nobody's as bad as I was mm -hmm. but well, you were <laughs> I was worse well, I'm sure there's other people that were also but but you do have a story to tell but before we get into your story Betty talk a little bit about your background because we want to know uh, were you coming from a family that um, were not believers or were they believers uh, and where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit. I would like to tell you some of the Sudruth history is uh, my forefather was Abraham Sudruth who worked with Martin Luther when he wrote the Bible and he was a soldier that took care of Martin Luther to keep him from being killed while he was writing the Bible. Back then if you wrote the Bible they'd kill you. And so they started in France and went to England and in England they brought my forefather, Abraham Sudruth, brought the Bible to Washington, D.C., presented it to Abraham Lincoln. And we have a letter that, that is to our forefather congratulating him. And I mean, it's got the White House and everything on it. Congratulating That's, him for bringing the first Bible honor. to America. So that word, you know, it's hereditary to me. Yes, you know. yes. So I have a history. Yes. But I had one of the most godly mothers ever was. Um, I'm Paul Young and Cho's mother-in-law's successor, and she mentored me, and my mother was that type of woman. Uh, if we got hurt, she prayed for us, and we were instantly healed. I don't care if we broke a finger or whatever, God instantly healed us. I had a brother that was born with leukemia, and uh, they sent him home to die, and uh, Mama called the preacher, and they prayed, and my brother today has grandchildren. You know, leukemia, you died back then, and you could give him milk and watch it go right through his little body. Another brother was born paralyzed, and his head was bigger than his body. And again, they prayed, and God literally healed him. So I'm not talking about little things in our family. We never, ever went to a hospital or 13. 13? 13, 13, of us. 13 uh -huh. children? Uh-huh, seven brothers and six sisters. 
That's a big family. Mm -hmm. And uh, God has just, uh, just blessed our lives. I have a wonder, wonderful family. And from being so poor from so many children, every one of us today either own our business or, you know, have homes and stuff. So we've really uh, done Now they great. saved? Uh, Your family saved? Well, praise God. Uh, when I came back home from North Carolina, I prayed every morning at 4.30 for four years. And the first day I opened my church doors, I preached my first sermon. I invited all my family in honor of my mother who had passed away. And they all came. I mean, my aunts and my cousins, my sisters and brothers and their children and great children. And every one of them received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior but one. And since then, I said to Sarah's prayer with her and so Oh, her. hallelujah. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And then I've won 551 of another family since in my church. So all of one, all seem, one family? I seem to win families mm. at one time. Well, that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to be united. Prayer. Yes, it does. A lot of prayer. Yes. And I asked God. I cried the whole time I was leading them to Jesus. And I said, God, this is awesome. Nobody wins their whole family. Well, why did you honor me so? He said, because you were consistent. No matter how you felt, if you drove all night at 430, you crawled out on your knees and you cried out to me for your family's salvation. Well, maybe somebody out there can learn something from that. Amen. We all need to hear that. How to pray for their family. Yes. They have to be consistent. Yes. Do you, do you, what day. about fasting? Did you fast also? I have fasted. I fasted for 20 years, and eight of those years I fasted every single week for three days. Actually, I would eat one meal between a fasting retreat and go to the next and, and fast three more days. I almost hurt my health that way, but... I used to think that I had to fast before I preached every sermon, but I got to preaching every day, and that got pretty hard. And God said, do you think that fasting makes you more anointed? And I said, it helps, don't it? And he said, no, the Word is what makes you anointed. Oh. He said, the fasting just keeps the flesh down. Mm -hmm. I asked Mama Choi one time. I called her Mama Choi. Her name is, is uh, Dr. Joshua Che. But I always called her Mama Choi, and she called me daughter. And... Uh, I asked her one time, I said, Mama, do you think I should fast 40 days, or what, how long should I fast? She said, no, said, um, you have learned to control self. And I learned that through writing a book on self. Because self took me to hell, I didn't want self to, I knew self could take me back to hell. And I didn't want to go to hell, so I searched the scriptures on everything about self. And I had to make my body, didn't want to read the Word of God or study the Word of God. So I had to disbit. Paul said to disbit. I would be playing a tape and driving, and I would get to look at a scenery or something and get awful listening to that tape. I played the Bible on tape 24 hours a day to myself to re renew my mind, you know. And I'd just reach up and slap myself. And I'd say, well, you little smart thing, you didn't listen. We're going to play that tape all over again. You have to start all over. <laughs> So I had to discipline myself, mm -hmm. and I would discipline myself, and, well, you're not getting no food today because you, you didn't read it or you didn't study. So I, and now I'll say, now, do you want to go without food for three days? You better get with it. See, I talk to myself. I make mm -hmm. myself do. Mm -hmm. And so discipline is a word. You've got to make yourself get in the word. You've got to make yourself pray. Self is, is your enemy. Yes. And I don't mind me. You got to get to the place where you make both your your mind, your soul, your will, and your emotions, your mind. You got to make both your soul and your body line up with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let Him lead you. Amen. But I'm getting ahead of. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> we have to get back to your childhood. Where were you born and raised, Betty? I was born in in Caldwell County in North Carolina, for the Blue Ridge Mountains. Oh, beautiful area. It's and, awesome. And and you were brought up. You said your mother was a praying woman. So yes. she was a Pentecostal Christian, a Church of God, Bible believing. Mm -hmm. I was raised up in the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with going off track? What happened? It seemed like back then that it seemed like uh, parents like for their children to get married young, especially daughters, so they wouldn't get pregnant or. You know, anything like that, being in the church I was, everything was a sin, so there wasn't no danger in that. But uh, each one of us, almost all of us girls, got married at 15. And when I got 15, um, this man come to our church, and our uncle 
my cousin was a, was our pastor at the time. Back then you couldn't afford a one-time pastor. They'd go to this church and that church and you had a rotation. And every time he'd come, he brought this man that worked with him that played musical instruments. And so I started singing with him. I sang, my sister and I. Well, my sister got married, so I was the only one left singing. And so we started a band in the church, the pastor's two kids and us. And so the pastor wants to take us to all the churches. So this man liked me and started liking me. I was wanting the Holy Spirit. I wasn't interested in no boyfriend or nothing. From a little girl, uh, I think I was born a prophetess. Uh, I would go up on the, in the woods and lay down in the grass and look up to clouds and me and Jesus would talk and he would tell me Bible stories. He would make me sheeps in the clouds and the shepherd and talk to me about the Bible. I seen the spirit realm even as a child, so I was really interested in church. I couldn't get enough of it. And I was really interested. I wanted the Holy Spirit. But I thought you had to do things to get the Holy Spirit. I asked everybody to forgive me. I done everything I needed to do to get the Holy Spirit. And we was at Pepper's Creek one night and we'd been I'd been to the altar and I'd prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. I'm getting ahead of myself because I ain't married yet. I could done got married now. Anyway a girl come up there and just received the Holy Spirit like that. And I said, God, if you want these people to stay that's fine with me. I'm going back to Alder and I ain't getting up until you give me the Holy Spirit. When I stepped off, I was singing. When I stepped off the platform, I received the Holy Spirit, fell on the floor, <laughs> saw Jesus standing over me. Mm -hmm. And whenever I come to, I was speaking in tongues. I spoke in tongues for two weeks. You're talking about being happy to have the Holy Spirit. So that was really, was, was, I was so happy at that time. Uh, this man asked my parents if he could marry me, and they said yes. And I said, Mama, if you won't make me get married, I wash dishes all the time. Um, I was not really mature enough for it, and I didn't love him. And uh, so we got married. And so, so actually, you you had to abide by what your parents mm -hmm. wanted you to do. How much older was this man? About six or seven years older than I was. Had he ever been married before? No. And it was he considered and he a good Christian? And he was a Baptist man, and I was a Pentecostal oh. man. We was not evenly yoked either. No. And um, I had a baby um, time I was 17, and um, I had another baby. I had six children time I was 21. Oh, my goodness. So I was pregnant the whole time I was married. Mm -hmm. And he sang, and the, with the last baby, uh, I fell, and I was uh, had to stay in bed the whole just about the whole time. Who took care of your children? And um, you well, just married I did somehow. And, uh, somehow, yeah, mm -hmm. I had a hard time. I, I don't even like to think about it because I. It was so sad. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was happy with my children. I love children. I, I just my children is everything in the world to me, and That's my sad. great grandchildren now is my baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love them. They mm -hmm. love me too. Anyway, um, my husband had to travel without me singing. We were by this time singing in every church on the television, on the not television but radios. radio. And he traveled out me, and uh, uh, he left me. I'm 21, and I just had a baby, and it's two months old, and I've never worked. I don't know how to work or anything, what to do, and I know we're going to starve. And so a lady at Church of God told me she would help me get a job on cotton mill. And so I worked two jobs trying to feed me and the kids, and he'd went to another town. And um, I sort of, when I went to church, the people act like that I had to itch and they was going to catch it. They act like they didn't want nothing to do with me. Why was the that? The church just wasn't there for me. Mm -hmm. I called the pastor and told him my husband left, and I said, I don't know what to do. Would you come in and tell me? Mm -hmm. And uh, Mama raised us up that a pastor don't do no wrong. They're godly. You look up to them. You honor them. And I didn't understand him when he said, I can't come because you're alone. I said, uh-uh, I got all six kids here. I didn't understand what he was right, trying to right. say to me. Mm -hmm. And he could have brought his wife. Right. But he never came. Or anyone you know, else if, in the church. You know, if I'd went to hell, mm -hmm. my blood been on their hands for this. And we, we can't be this way. We've got to really go out there for that one that really needs help. That, that could have prevented a life yes. that I had ahead of me that could have been used for yes, the glory of God because right. I was called to preach at 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, um, I sort of got, I felt alone, unloved. I felt like I'd done something that my husband left me. 
I don't know what I could have done because all I was was a wife and mother to the children and having a baby all the time. You're pregnant all the time, I don't know what, you know. So you probably felt that some of it was your fault. That, I thought that it was all left. my fault. All your I fault. couldn't be loved. I oh. thought I couldn't be loved. I mm -hmm. thought that I wasn't loved. Why did he leave you? Did you ever find out why he left you? He got he got involved with someone else. Oh, because he was on the road without pregnant. you, probably. Mm -hmm. But um, I really didn't love, I didn't know how to be a wife like I know today, you know what I'm saying. I was too young, to, too immature to know these things and all. I don't know, maybe I didn't fulfill him. I don't know. I don't blame him all. I just know things happened. Anyway, uh, I started getting bitter toward him. I got bitter and blamed mom and daddy. Um, Let me interrupt you one second here. Did your mother or your dad ever come to your rescue at all to help you with the situation you were in with no. all the children? They they probably couldn't or they were too busy with Well, my mother had so many, so of many other children. Mm -hmm. And she worked. Oh dear. And so she um, had her hands full. She had her hands full too. And we were taught not to tell your stuff outside. You don't discuss your husband. Your father is your father, and you never discuss your family. You never talk outside of your home. So we never talked about my daddy, and I never talked about my husband. It was my, it's your choice to, for that husband, and you don't talk about him. And he's a father of your children, so I didn't want to cause disrespect on the father of my children. You right. understand? Yes. So I never said nothing to anybody. I just bore it. Mm -hmm. It was my bed. I had to lie in it, so to speak. And so that's the way I felt. But inside, I couldn't help but to get bitter mm -hmm. and hurt. Here I'm alone, and I'm working so hard, and I'm lonely. And I'm 21 years old, and i got six kids. And who could ever love me or want me, you know? See, this is the devil uh, planting all of these things in us this way. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you, whenever you let bitterness come in, it brings cancer with it every time. You show me somebody controlled by man, and you show somebody's life is like that, and I'll show you somebody will end up dying with cancer. Every time. My sister did. Uh, every time it, the, the women has a husband that's overbearing, we're, we're there, not free. You see, you're, you have to have peace in your, in your body. So I ended up in can with the cancer about nine months later. And, uh, and you were still 21. Uh-huh. And they was going to send me home to die. I was in the hospital for a month, and I had a complete hysterectomy. Now what? Now I got to stop you right there. You went in the hospital, and did you did you know when you went in the hospital how sick you were or what the diagnosis was? Oh yes, was? Uh, it happened. I went to my boss told me if I didn't quit hemorrhaging on the job that he was going to fire me, and so I went to employment office to try to find another job. And when I did, something busted in me, and when it busted in me, blood started flying out of my body. And the women grabbed towels. I was in a beauty shop. I ran into a beauty shop, and they grabbed towels and. They said, you got to get to the hospital, you're, you're bleeding to death. And time I, I actually went and jumped in my car and drove to the hospital. And time I got to the hospital, God let, you know, he's been so good to me. He saved my life so many times. Uh, I, I was right in Statesville, and I went into one more hospital and just said, I'm bleeding to death, and fell on the floor. Mm -hmm. They rushed me right into surgery. And uh, they tried to control the bleeding, but I'd bleed faster. Because I was a bleeder, I bled faster. You were a bleeder? So I ended up. Did you know that you were a bleeder way back when? Uh, yes. When you had your children? I bled every time I had a baby, and mm -hmm. every time I had a baby, they'd tell me I'd die if I'd have another. Oh, all right. So I had a but hard time. But you didn't have any control because your husband was in control. That's yes. more or less what you're saying. We didn't know things back right, then right. about protection, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And if you told me I was pregnant and I was going to have a baby, you might as well say you're dying. Mm -hmm. So that was what I had to face that I may die this time. Mm -hmm. every time but the children are so precious and so sweet that right. I loved every one of them you know and, and praise God that nothing happened to them I know they, they were, were all, all healthy born. they're all healthy praise and, God. Uh, now you're in the hospital you gotta get back to where you're in the hospital and they're telling you that you have cancer no you, they didn't they oh, never they didn't told tell me you. ever I had oh. cancer they told my family back then they didn't tell you oh they tell your family all right and they told my family that I had cancer and they Actually, the sheriff went and got my husband, brought him. He had to sign papers for I could have a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And they brought him in. And uh, they told my mother, asked her if she could take the children. See, my children was a babysitter. I was rushed to the hospital, no place to take them. And so my brother got two of the children and took them to his house. And uh, my husband took the others to his mother and father's. He was living with his mother and father. And they, he said, the court told him, long as you have uh, you live with your mother and father, you can have the children. Mm 
He wasn't married at that time. I mean, no, he hadn't remarried. You weren't divorced. His girlfriend was living with him. But you weren't divorced at that time. No. Okay. So um, I didn't know I was dying. And first of all, I didn't believe you'd die because of miracles my mother had shown through history. Mm -hmm. And I would not accept cancer. I would not accept anything was wrong with me. And I said, I'll live. I know God. And I know I'm not going to die. And I just, I was fighting it, you know, really not realizing it. But I looked like I was dying all the time. So I couldn't get, I didn't have the children. And they said, wait till you get well and you can have the children back. But of course, they didn't expect me to get well. But I fooled them anyway. Well, after a month, I went to welfare and I said, I want my children back. And they told me I couldn't have them and uh, that they had give custody to my father and mother-in-law. And I got mad and I started choking that woman. I said, I, I'm the one bled and had these kids. I'm the one almost died for these kids. I'm, I, I love my kids. You can't take my kids. So I you can't just grabbed her by the neck and I started choke. shaking I her? Said, no. Yeah. Well, uh, somebody else picked up the phone and started to call the police. And I thought, if I go to jail, I can't get them. And it scared me. And I run out and got in my car and I took off. And it, it scared me so bad, I got to Charlotte and realized I wasn't out of their jurisdiction. Then I went to Atlanta, Georgia. Wish to God I'd never went there. <laughs> And when I got to Georgia, I think I had five dollars left time I got to Atlanta, and I tried to find a... I'd never seen anybody dressed in suits but preachers, so I seen these two guys in suits. They were pimps. <laughs> and I asked them where I could find a job singing country music. I was too weak. I couldn't hold down a job. If I went and tried to work a waitress, I'd swell. My legs would swell. How long were you out of the hospital at this time? A month. Oh, only over a, a month. month. Maybe six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'd start hemorrhaging, so I couldn't do anything. I knew I couldn't do anything because if I started hemorrhaging, and I was too scared, you know, mm -hmm. of what happened to me. So um, uh, they told me, yeah, I know where you get jobs in country music. So they sent me to the notary. The notary uh, had um, country music, go go dancers, had a variety show and strippers. And so I walked in, and uh, the lady, I asked her, I said, I would like to sing country music. I sing like Patsy Klein. See, we had a band, and I was used to sing. We used to sing all these songs together back when I was with my husband. So when you were with your husband, you weren't just singing church music. You were singing no, the clubs? No, at home, well, we could really get with oh, it, you okay. know, singing all those country songs, you know. All right. Really good at it. And uh, so she started giving, she pushed this drink over there, and it was a vodka Collins. Well, I, I didn't know anything about drinking. We don't have no bars where I'm so, from. So you went to the club that they yeah. sent you to. I'd never seen men. a club. You'd never, I'd never seen, seen a club. anything like it. I just thought it's a place where you sing country music. All oh. I know about was Grand Ole Opry, which I'd never been or anything, you know. And like the owner it. is the one that was interviewing you. She uh, was from. A, she had a Pentecostal background too, so but she, she wasn't using it. Or no, she or sized what? me up. Yeah. She owned the okay. place, so she knew if she got me drunk, she could. I was pretty, so she could. She, she could use me, you know, to make right. money off of. So she started feeding me vodka Collins, and she said it was like my mama's lemonade, drink it. And so I started drinking it, and she told me she'd give me a job making $150 a week. Well, I made 60 sewing in a factory, but I couldn't do this no more. So she, I said, what is go-go? And so she put a girl up there and showed me. And they had fringes, you know, shorts and top with fringes. Mm -hmm. You remember back in the 60s and 70s when that happened? And uh, I said, we don't even go swimming the opposite sex, and you want me to go up there and do that? But after she pushed a few more over there, I few got pretty drinks. brave. Mm -hmm. Well, I was raised up mostly in a black church, so I really had that groove, you know. And jive and rhythm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my daddy, he was jitterbugging Tom. I'm telling you, he loved to dance. So I've, I ended up doing pretty good. And after, at first, when I first went up there, it was like it wasn't club people, it was like church people, and as I danced, the tears ran down my face. Did you feel that? It hurt, mm -hmm. but I knew if I didn't make money, I couldn't get my kids. And the doubt, but here's what happened, here's why I did it. I'm sitting there and I said, I can't do that. And the devil said, well, that's pride, said, you're not a fit mother, and you should lose your kids. You don't deserve your kids. Most mothers would do anything to get their kids back. And I said, I am not proud. 
and I will get, I want my kids back. And he said, if you really did, you'd go up there and do that and make that money. You see, this is what the devil does. He entices you. Yes, he does. Most of the times mm -hmm. with money mm -hmm. to get you to do something. And finally, you know, you're half drunk by this time, not even realizing you're drunk because you ain't never been drunk or never drank, and you'll do anything. See, that's how Satan tries to entice you to get you to this place. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll show you. And so I go up there and I do it. Daddy, we're out of time. We got, well, this is such an amazing testimony, as I said in the beginning of the program. And we're going to bring you back next week, and we're going to finish the story. So I hope that the people that are watching this tonight will tune in again next week. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. I believed in miracles. I've seen a soul set free. Miraculous, a changing one. Redeemed through Calvary. I've seen the lily push its way. Welcome back to Healing Miracles and our incredible guest that we had on last week who is continuing with her story, Betty. And Betty has quite a story. And we kind of left you hanging. She has come out of uh, so many things. Of course, she has been a Christian on fire for the Lord for 30-some years. She is now a pastor. But she wasn't always that way. So we're going to continue where we left off. We're just kind of going to jump in and we'll let Betty take over. So we have to be very careful when people lay hands on us. You know, I'm you glad know, you're tell saying you how that. To, I'm so glad you I'm mentioned that. I'm going to tell you that. what you say. This is what you say. Say, Father God, before anyone lays hands on me, I choose not to receive anything that's not of God. I choose to receive only spiritual things from God. Cover me with the blood and let nothing be transferred that's not of you. That's and that excellent. way you, you, you have that protection of God and they can't excellent. transfer it to you. You have to receive it. But see, when mm -hmm. you're open to a preacher or open to anybody to receive, you receive whatever's in them. Whatsoever's that's in a man scary. is what comes out. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be cautious. It's important for me to fast and pray that I stay clean. In other words, if I am not clean and keep myself clean, then I'm going to transfer whatever's in me to my congregation. Now I've got a whole congregation full of people. And I'm on television. I transfer it through the television network. Mm -hmm. So God's going to hold me responsible. Mm. And their blood's on my hands. So I know what I have to walk. And I'm going to walk mm -hmm. it because I don't want to go before God. And he saw all these peoples in hell because you transferred his spirit mm. and it wasn't strong enough. Mm. I'm telling you, we can get in trouble. We got As preachers, we got to really live a godly life for God and stay clean. Anyway, let's get back testimony because I know it'll bless your heart. I know it'll bless the people's heart out there. I, I, I just have to add free. one quick thing, and, and it, the, the Word tells us, don't let anyone lay hands on you hastily. Right. The Word that's Know right, those that's who right labor among you. You yes. know them, preacher. So I've been to so many prayer meetings, and I've been in church where a pastor will say, okay, who has a need? And somebody raises their hand. Okay, everybody go over, lay hands on that person. Or lay, on and, a, lay your hands on I the person know, in front of you. Yes, and I know that some of these people that I had to stop this more than once, have very serious health problems. 
and Morcerellos. And who, who knows what crusade. else is going on in their life. They said, lay your hands on the person in front of you, and somebody laid their hands on me, and all of a sudden everything went black, and it was like I was dying. It was like that man was killing me. Mm. And it was this dark spirit, and, and it was pushing me down, down into darkness. And all of a sudden I just started speaking in tongues and throwed his hands off of me. It's trying to kill me. Sure. So I, after that, I, I said, nobody's laying their hands on mm -hmm, me no more mm -hmm. unless right. the Holy right. Spirit tells That's me. That's right. That's very good, Betty. At this time in, in my life, um, my girlfriend come up from Miami and talked me into moving to Miami. And uh, she'd been a good friend of mine since schoolgirl days. And so I decided to go, go to Miami and I so went So stop down. right there. So you left? Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Ex Atlanta, Georgia, where you were dancing in a club, and you went to Miami. A lot of people out there knows who Morgana is, and she was my best friend. I would work for her and stuff when she wanted to go somewhere or something, but we were really, we used to do wild things, and then sh she did all, you know, she's the one that run on the, out on the ball field without her top and kissed the, uh, oh, got arrested. And that was her? That was nationwide, <laughs> yeah. So we were good buddies back then, so if you know Morgana days, you know my days. I was called Vicki Lee from Big Day. I was, had been in Texas for 10 years, so I had that Texas drawing accent and done country, you know, music. And so I moved to uh, Miami, Florida, and uh, I tried to go straight, and I got a job in a bar, bartending, and they sold a bar after and under me. It seemed like that the devil just tried to keep me in burlesque. And so, um, I was offered a job in Berlayas, and, uh, and I went and got a job, and um, this uh, owner had clubs all over the world, and I went to work in some of the finest clubs in Miami Beach, and um, he had a contract, a woman break a contract with him, and she was the sweetest blue angel was her name, and so because uh, I was very alluring in, in my songs, I would do slow songs and, and really alluring type of so you were singing Act, now? Acting it, you know. Okay. And uh, he decided to make me famous with an act. And uh, he said, because I have a contract that says angel, I have to make you something angel. And he said, when you get wild with that snake, I'm just going to call you Satan's angel. And I said, boy, that'll show him. I was mad at the church for not being there for me and all. Oh, and the that, years back, you were still mad at them. Yes, and All I right. thought, that'll show them. Mm -hmm. and, and I accepted that, how awful that was. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, they advertised me as Satan's angel, the devil's own mistress. Oh, my. But I want to tell you something. I learned by being his mistress. I learned by being his angel. I learned his ways. I learned how he operates. And now I turn it on him. Good I girl. use all of that. Mm -hmm. So every experience I've ever had, it taught me a lesson, and today I reverse it. I'm one that knows him, and I know how he works, and I know what he does to get people, and I know, and now I'm his, next to Jesus, I'm his number one enemy. I want you <laughs> to know, God. I hate him for what he done to me. Mm -hmm. And I'll get even with him by getting everybody else saved and set free. Amen. Glory well, to God. He Hallelujah. Such, he is He's such real. a liar, isn't he? The Lord. He is. So I become Satan's angel, the devil's own Everything. mistress, and they booked me all over uh, circuits. Mm -hmm. So I started traveling and doing shows. And uh, when I come back from my circuit, they told me that they wanted to book me in Las Vegas. And so I decided that if I went to Las Vegas that I would have competition because there's some awesome looking women in Las Vegas. And... Uh, so I went and I decided, to, I looked at everyone. This girl named Cindy was Frank Sinatra's favorite stripper. So I wanted to have breasts like her. So I went to the finest surgeon in Miami. And I told him that I wanted 42s. Walked in, I said, I want 42s. The devil told me before I went in, don't you tell them you're a bleeder because if you do, they won't do the surgery. So I didn't tell them. And so when they cut me open, the blood started going all over the doctor's eyes and glasses, and I could feel it just like squirting like a fountain all over me, hot and sweet. Well, weren't, weren't you unconscious? No, you're semi-conscious. Oh, okay. And all of a sudden the devil said, you know, I told you to tell you to tell. And I said, yeah. And he said, that's your blood. I killed you. <laughs> you see, Satan takes you so far and so far, and then when he thinks he's killing you, he laughs at you. 
So if you're out there and you're really, and the and, and devil is taking you and getting you into all this, honey, I'm telling you right now, just like he did to me, he's trying to kill you. He's trying to steal your, your soul. And then he's going to life as you die. He's going to life as you die, I'm telling you. I've exp I'm not telling you about something I don't know. I'm telling you about something that happened. And you better get loose. You better come to Jesus Christ because he is out to steal, to kill, and take from you. And Jesus is out to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. He's a thief. Don't listen to him. Don't obey him. Run from him. Amen? Amen. This is a good time for you to pray with somebody out there right now. They're Father God, right now, you know who's listening, who's watching to me. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how bad you feel. Jesus loves you. He created you. He made you in his image. I don't care what anybody's ever told you. You're not bad. You're not evil. It's the evil one trying to make you evil and putting spirits in you. You can say, I don't want this no more, but I want Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus Christ will come in and he'll take your sins away? He'll put them in the sea for forgetfulness, never to be remembered. You will be new created. New created means you're brand new. There's nothing in you, nothing in you of the world, nothing in you of the devil. And now you're a brand new baby, you're a brand new computer. Now you've got to put the Word of God in you. Compute your brain now with the Word of God. But just say, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you be my personal Savior? Would you forgive me of your sins? I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And today I'm asking you to forgive me and come in and be my Savior. I accept you today as Lord and Savior. If you've done that, please call the number on the screen and tell someone and let them pray with you. You need to confess that you are born again, praise God. Now ask them to fill with you, you with the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth because He will. But I want to tell you, He'll deliver you whenever you ask Him to come in. That means that you are delivered. That means that you're set free. That means that you're saved for eternity. And that means that you have prosperity and you have healing. You got all those things when you said, I do to Jesus. Amen. 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 Isn't that exciting? That's, that's exciting. And I'm sure that people have just received that, many of them, and they, they'll be calling in. But Betty, we don't have a whole lot of time left, so we have to continue with your story. Okay. Now, you were on the operating table, and, and you were bleeding I was to hemorrhaged death. in death, and it kept me open too long, and uh, I took a staph infection, but they did save my life. And I went home, and I had to take antibiotics. Well, he tried to heal me with antibiotics and overdose me. And on Thanksgiving Day, 1974, 4.30 in the evening, my husband gave me a shot of antibiotic. He says, I, after 12 years of burlesque, I found an older man and married me an older man. How much older? Uh, 10 years. Oh, that's not that bad. <laughs> they used to kid me. He was a big John that come in all the time and had his blows thousands of dollars and they said you gonna marry that old rich man mm -hmm. but I never had anyone treat me wonderful and he treated me wonderful and special like I was a real special person mm -hmm. and I fell in love with the old oh, goat that's mm -hmm. why we, told we him, called, him. called him back mm -hmm. then you know mm -hmm. but I just I fell in love with him because he was so good to me and um, he decided that he couldn't keep me out of the business that I was unhappy and drank too much so he helped me get more famous and bought me a motor home to travel in and stuff. But when I had to, he gave me a penicillin reaction and when he did, I felt it go up my spine and hit my mouth and instantly it was like a locked jaw and I started seeing in my brain red lights and blue lights flashing. The spirit spoke and said, this is it, you're dying. I said, no, I'm too young to die. I said, it can't be, oh, old people die, I, I'm too, no, it, it ain't happening to me, it can't be happening to me. And this voice said, yes, you've had your opportunity. It is happening to you. You are dying. And about that time, I felt uh, every artery in my body looked like, felt like it's going like from electricity from each one to the other exploding. And I felt my heart explode, and I felt the blood gushing. I could feel it going <laughs> like this. Up. And I come out of my body. This time I died and just come right out of my body in a black silhouette of a man picked me up and took me on the other side of the room. I could see my husband calling 911. I could see he had screamed for the children. I'd got back four of my children and they come running in and are rubbing me all over. And my little girl's on top of me and she's said, Mama, don't die. Mama, don't leave me. You can't leave me again, Mama. She's always fearful for me leaving her because I'd had to leave her with her daddy so mm -hmm. long yeah, time before I got before. her back. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had stole it for them back. I'd just go into town, steal them, take off with them. But uh, 
at this time, I said, Devil, you told me that that they wouldn't have here after I didn't have to worry about it. But I said, that's my body over there. What's this? And I touched my body, Joan, and it's just like the body I got But right the now. devil lied to you again. He told you that you there was no hereafter, I that didn't you would just to go to sleep. sleep. Every time I conscious mm -hmm. of me, he'd tried to tell me, okay. oh, there are no hereafter. They've lied mm -hmm. to you. You just go to sleep, and that's it. Like, it's in. And I said, you lied to me. I said, I'm dead. I said, look there. That's my body. That's my children. That's my husband. But what's this? And at that moment, another spirit come in a room, and when it did, Satan went, shh. And it was gone. And this spirit took me real fast to heaven. In seconds, I was in heaven and laid me down just like this. And I heard a voice say, How well do you know my son? And all of a sudden, I looked up. I was scared to look up at the voice I heard. I was shook. There's, there's something. You're, you're scared to death. It's just, I can't explain it. But when I looked up, I saw this right here open in heaven, big as a building. This Bible. is the Son of God. I never knew that Jesus was the Word of God till then. I saw my Bible, my life passed before me of my Bible in my house everywhere, and the Spirit would be telling me, you need to read it, you need to read it. And I'd bypass it, let me do this, let me dry the baby, let me get a bottle, let me do it, let me, let me, let me. Let me. I knew I was guilty of not knowing the Word of God. I knew I'd had those years to get in that word and I hadn't studied and know Jesus. I truly don't believe you know Jesus Christ until you know the Word of God. That's true. And at that time, I was taken cast out of heaven and started falling into hell. And it was a black of eternity and it's like black mire seed we dripped in motor oil. The way I describe it was as I went, the Lord got on me and it's like it's entangling me. And I could see demonic spirits of every kind coming to take me to this pit. And this pit was like a liquid volcano of fire, fire shooting up, people screaming every time that it would shoot up. And, and demons bringing our kids in, teenagers in, by the thousands, millions of teenagers have been brought into hell. And um, Satan screaming at them to go get more. And I'm falling into this. And all of a sudden, I remember my Sunday school teacher teaching me, Jesus loves me, this I know. That little song that Jesus, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Isn't that something, all the word I've heard amazing? all my life, what, what I remembered, it was a Sunday school teacher, how important they are to little kids. That song is what brought me out of hell. That saved you. Yes. And I started saying, yes, uh, she hugged me and told me she loved me and she was going to teach me this little song. It said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. I said, yeah, the Bible said it. If I could just reach Jesus. And at that moment, I was turned upright over hell. I'm a dangling over hell. You were dangling over hell. Joan, you left me over hell for a week. <laughs> <laughs> dangling. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was cute, wasn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I seen this light. Uh, it's like a pinhead of light. It was all in a vast darkness. There's no darkness to describe like being cut off from man and from God. It, it is the most scary. And silence. Oh, it, it, it's, it took me two years, and they had to knock me out all the time to get over what I saw. It took me two years to get over it without going in. I would go into these places where I'd start shaking all over, and I couldn't stand it. When, when it just come on me all of a sudden. It was how drastic it was, the shock to my body it was. I mean, but, you tried to share it with people. Is that what you mean? No. Uh, I could see something on television would bring it on, and my husband and oh. daughter would have to hold me down to give me something knock me out. I Is would just start shaking right? all over. It was that drastic mm. and shocking to my system of what I saw in hell. Anyway, uh, I, I said, if I look down, it's hell. Peter looked down and went in the water. I, I can't be like Peter. I've got to watch this light, and I've got to watch this light, and I kept looking at that light. And John, when it got to me, it was Jesus, and he pulled me the light right up through the light. And I saw as I went through him, I watched the alcohol habit, the pill habit, the lust habit all burnt out of me. Everything I had in me burnt out of me. Heal me. Give me a new blood. I bled to death. There was no blood in They say that the doctor said that my blood veins all opened up and spilled out of my blood out of me. All my blood was gone. There was no blood in my body. And Jesus had to give me a new blood, and now I got his blood. His blood. I don't have, and I don't have a bleeding problem no more. I was healed of the bleeding problem. I was healed of everything in me. My doctor says I'm the healthiest woman she ever examined. There's nothing wrong with me. My blood pressure is 120 over 70 all the time, every time. 
my cholesterol. My good cholesterol is so high, I never have to worry about my bad. <laughs> so everything in my body has been perfected. I think it's perfected by the Word of God. But Amen. Jesus, I went through Jesus back into my body. And when I got back into my body, he said, I'll let you live if you'll preach. Well, I had just enough Baptist background, but I didn't believe women could preach, and so I didn't want to preach. And he said, uh, if, I'll let you live if you'll, if you'll go tell the whole world that I'm coming soon. I want you to go to the whole world. He didn't give me a little ministry. He gave me a world ministry, he told me. And I said, Lord, I said, nobody wants to is ever going to believe a stripper, and everybody's ever going to believe an exotic person. And he said, Murray was a prostitute. See, a, a, a stripper thinks herself a little bit higher than a prostitute, that they're below him. He knows exactly where you're at and what you think and how you think, and that's how, you know, he let me know. Anyway, he said she was a prostitute and said to list day people honor her. Well, he shot that question down, my excuse, in other words. And then I said, well, Lord, I said, my husband, he's married again and got kids, and I can't get him back. And I said, he said, but the woman dwell had more husbands than you and said, I forgave her and she went and told many. And she's known to this day for bringing many into the kingdom of God. And I said, but Lord, I said, I'm not educated. And I said, I can't read a whole chapter without missing a word. How can I preach it and read it to people? He said, that's when tears run down his face. And he said, most people are too educated for me to teach. And he said, don't worry about it. And he reached behind him and he picked up this thing and it had fire on it and he stuck it in my mouth. He said, don't worry, it will never be your word that comes out of your mouth. He said, my fire is going to come out of your mouth. Wow. And from that day forward, it's come out of my mouth. But he said, I'm giving you the greatest professor in the world. I said, what's his name? <laughs> so I'm just a little country guy. I don't know how to approach God, but I do now. Mm -hmm. And he said, the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit, set me down and give me the Bible. And he made me play the tape. And I'd start down through here listening to that tape and reading it. And every time I'd get to word, I'd, I'd say, oh, that's how you say that word. He'd say, play it again, play it again, play it again till you could say the word. And I would play that. He made me play the Bible on tape, one tape for 30 days, 24 hours a day. How many tapes did you have? The whole Bible. The whole Bible, which was probably... I did this for seven years till I could memorize tapes. every mm -hmm. tape. Mm -hmm. Till I oh. knew the next word. Amazing. He said, you can't watch no preachers on television. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to get no doctrines. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to listen to nobody. I don't want you to read no books. I want you to know from the Holy Spirit teaching. So I ain't had none of that. I've had the Holy Ghost teach me. Joan, I can sit down like you've seen my manuals, and I yes. can write one of the manuals without this now. Mm. I can get up here and I start mm -hmm. quoting to you and start preaching on a subject. And if you started preaching me and you was a preacher preaching, my computer starts bringing up, but it says and so-and-so, it says and so-and-so, and my mind is constantly bringing everything in a Bible together about what you're saying. And I'll know whether you're off or whether you're on. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. see, you will not. You'll have discernment. Mm -hmm. He said to discern the Word. So I, I discern it. Not only do I discern the Word, I discern spirits to see if they be of God. We've got to do all that. Anyway, I got on fire for God. I'm telling you, I come out of there and I become, I was a radical Christian. I was afraid to open my mouth, afraid to cuss, because I could cuss. And I had a bad habit of saying a big bad word that women shouldn't say. So I wouldn't talk and I had to take it slow. And so I got in the Bible and started finding out all about self, and that's how I wrote a self book, mm -hmm. was to get rid of self. I started fasting and praying. I would fast every single day because I seen all these teenagers. Demons were bringing teenagers in oh, by the thousands. Oh, you mentioned that at the last program. They and were so brought in to hell teenagers. Killed every way, OD'd every, day, every way, sacrificed every way you could kill them. They were bringing them in. So I decided every teenager I missed would go to hell. So every morning before I would eat breakfast, I wouldn't eat. I would go out to benches, shopping centers, anywhere. And I had to win at least six people to Jesus every time that I went out. And or I was afraid to go to hell. And I kept doing this every single day. Well, um, my husband and I drove an 18-wheeler, and I learned if I pushed that, got on the speaker, we owned a business. And oh. if I was traveling and driving, mm -hmm. I could push down on that mic, and I could talk from here to Canada. And so I started telling my testimony from here to Canada and went in truck drivers and stopping and going in and praying with them. Well, the Trucker Association found out and they 
started taking me to the truck stops and giving my testimony, and all these truckers were coming from everywhere, and we was having revivals in truck stops. <laughs> well, Seven Clumber is uh -huh. in Virginia, you know, and I was in Virginia preaching it one day, come down, found out, so they come to Miami and took me into our testimony and did it. The 700 and, Club. Yes, mm -hmm. and then they played it about seven times, and then it, it, they still played a lot. And Then Trinity brought me in, and this one brought me in. Next thing you know, I'm all over the world. But um, I went to Key West, Florida, and while I was in Key West, Florida, I gave out about 15,000 tracts and took all the teenagers out on the street to take Key West for Jesus because it is a homosexual capital now. Well, while I'm on the street, the Lord said, I want you to go to the mayor. I didn't know he's gay, but I went to the gay mayor and said, I want you to prophesy to him. This girl said, I'll take you. I know where he's at. And so we walk in, people sitting on the couch. I have no idea who it is. And I'm in the spirit, you see. And I walk in, I said, that's saith the Lord God. And I start prophesying to him. And his hands went up over his head. He thought I, like I was going to shoot him. It oh. But it was so powerful when it came out. It, like, it, it was like I could see the wind blowing him from my mm. mouth. Mm -hmm. It was that powerful. Mm. And by the time I got through, he was crying. And he brought his hands down, walked over and handed me his hands and let me pray with him. That was a news meal sitting on his couch. A what? Well, the next day it showed me oh, praying for the Oh, it was a for the person, mayor, a reporter. And this may, mayor changed with the one to help the preachers near him. I did a crusade. The Church of God and Assembly of God wasn't talking. Here they were in there to hear my testimony because of what I'd done. Mm -hmm. Here was a glow and gospel businessman that wouldn't talk to each other. This <laughs> competition, all these were competition. The devil was using this, you know. Mm -hmm. Here everybody mm -hmm. is in there because I was in the news media. And they seen, I love this gay man and prayed with him. All these gay people come. Oh. All these strippers come. It had us ex stripper. Mm -hmm. All these women that was, was uh, prostitutes came. And honey, when I started telling my testimony, homosexual started, uh, uh, spirits started coming out. Uh, demons started coming out of a multiple while I'm standing in the pulpit. Here's a church God pastor and a similar God preacher both over there cast them out together. Here's every one of them come together all over the place just casting out these demons. It was just a, it was a revival like you've never seen, but the whole city was healed. Well, God spoke to two men and told them to give me $3,000 to go to the Philippines. I'd sent a newsletter to the Philippines and I'd bought them a bus in the Philippines to help them start churches over two brothers. And I'd sent them a picture of casting demons out. To, here was a man with a demon, here's a man without, and you could tell the transparency of it, of it you know. And they asked me to come to a crusade, and I thought that I was supposed to go to the Philippines. But I go back home with my 3000 My husband said, honey, call a travel agent. And I said, they will help you put that together. Because I didn't know. I'd never been out of the country. I didn't know how to do it. And I called up this number, and evidently I dialed it backwards or something. And this man said, uh, I give my spill. And he said, lady, you got the wrong number but the right number. I said, what you mean? He said, this is God. And I said, I call a travel agent, and man tells me that he's God. <laughs> and I said, who is this? And he said, I'm the president of Korean Airlines. And God just spoke to me and said, it is not the Philippines he's trying to get you to. It's Paul Young and Cho's church. Oh, now, my. Now, let's backtrack a little bit. And that's in when, Korea? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, when Reagan got shot, he had an encounter with God in emergency room. And he told me to let him live if he would put prayer back in school and bring prayer back in our nation. So he went to his people and said, who, what nation has ever been changed by prayer? Do you know of one research for me? They said, yes, so Korea. It was a Buddhist country. And said this woman founded a prayer mountain ministry and her son-in-law and her pastored it and said they all were Buddhists. And now they have a million people born again.
Turn. Uh-huh. 